who pays for risk? Who pays for bailouts? Well, the recent financial crisis would tell us that taxpayers do that. But in the wake of all of this, there have been several financial experts who have been creating different ways of paying for risk. And one of those creators is INSEAD Professor of Finance, Theo Vermeulen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. You have created something, the acronym of which is a coerc, which is convertible capital. Yeah, it's contingent kind of a, capital. It, yeah, it's a form of contingent capital. So contingent capital is uh, basically bonds that mandatory convert when a bank gets into trouble. What you've invented is called a, a coerc. Now, what does what does that mean exactly? Coerc is a call option enhanced reverse convertible, which, which is very complicated. But really, uh, the easier way to remember is is that it's kind of a coercive instrument. It coerces in some way the equity holders to pay back the bondholders in case of financial distress. Uh, in other words, the bondholders will not be bailed out by the government, but they will be bailed out by the equity holders. Now, coercing this, of course, sounds very bad, basically, in, mm, in the sense it, from, it sounds bad for the equity holders. But the advantage for the equity holders is that the bondholders know this will happen, so therefore the, the equity holders will be able to issue bonds at a very low interest rate, very close to the government bond rate, because the bondholders know they will going to be bailed out. Like creating such a commitment is typically very difficult to do. I cannot, how could I commit as an equity holder to bail you out when you're into trouble? In a normal circumstance, you can't do that. But this instrument actually is designed in such a way that it's a credible commitment. And because it's credible, the issuer, the bank basically, will be able to borrow at rates close to the riskless rate. But that means that the bond actually becomes a form of issuing more equity. At a yeah, basically, point. at the time, bas what will happen is that that will be repaid, and the and will be will basically be uh, you know will be repaid by a new equity issue, a new rights issue. So the way it works is that when uh, there is a convert in every and all of these deals, there's a there's a trigger price, the price when the conversion has to take place. In other words, if it's going down, you, yeah, s you if figure if it goes down, let's say below a certain level. So the stock price goes below five bucks. That's what we call the trigger price. At that moment in time the bondholders have to convert. And there's a second price is the conversion price. The conversion price tells you how many shares you will get if you convert. There's a big gap. It basically means that when the stock price is five bucks, then the conversion price could be very low, let's say one dollar. It basically means that you will basically, as a bondholder, be able to convert your one thousand dollar bond into one thousand shares. Now that will mean massive dilution for the equity holders, because remember your stock price was five, and now you're allowing those bondholders to converge at a huge discount from the market price. In other words, what you've done here is basically making, in this way, you're making the debt more or less risk-free because the equity holders, of course, want to avoid that uh, massive dilution and therefore they will raise equity and pay back the debt holders. But they wouldn't lose. That's what you're basically doing. What will change, of course, is that your cost of financial distress are going to be lower so it's not going to be about the discount rate, but you will have improved cash flows as a result of avoiding financial distress. So how did you come up with this idea? Uh, basically, I read, do a lot of res did some research on debt spiral convertibles, right? So debt spiral convert are convertibles that also convert into stock, but where the conversion price floats. And we have shown, as a paper with Pierre Hillion, where we finally shown that these things are very bad for investors because bondholders, they will tend to do, they short the stock drive down the price, and then convert at a big discount from the market price, and take control over the company this way. And this is also the main concern that people have about these reverse convertibles with market-based triggers. Because they say the bondholder basically will buy the bond, short the stock, drive down the company's share price below fair value, and then force conversion. And the great thing about this scheme is that you've shorted stocks, but in a normal short situation, you have to buy the shares back in the market. Here, the company will deliver you the shares to cover your short position. This is the, an ultimate short seller's dream, right? And this is why, uh, that's why the bankers and the financial community says, well, this is actually, that's the main problem with the market triggers. Also, there could be panic. There could be irrational panic. Maybe people think that you go bankrupt, and that's not really true. And the bonds convert, and they take over the, the significant stake of the company. That, that's really... They can also be used by takeover guys that basically buy the bond, short the stock, and, and get control over the firm. So there's always these this control issues, which are especially important in Europe, where a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of, in Europe, many companies have to issue shares to rights issues exactly to give the right of first refusal to the 
existing stockholders to preserve existing shareholders' rights. And that's the main problem with these, with these market-based triggers. What is then the solution? Well, the solution basically is essentially is that we, we, we want to make sure that any type of dilution that is unjustified, unjustified by because a bondholder manipulates a stock or because there's panic or whatever, that this, that this conversion can be undone by giving the shareholders a right to first refusal. They will have the right basically to buy the shares at the same condition as the bondholders. They will they'll be able to buy stock at the conversion price. And that essentially basically means that you cannot do anything against the stockholders against their will. They will have the right for you to say, you, you know, if, if, if we don't want you to own the shares, we have the right basically to pay you back and buy the shares ourselves. This is actually, that's, that's the best protection that shareholders can have against basically manipulation. That case for manipulation sounds like a good case for more regulation. You're suggesting that this No manipulation, you, know, you cannot control, mani you cannot regulate manipulation, that's impossible. No. What you have to do is you have to discourage it by making it not profitable. I mean, this is the Kirk basically makes it, there's no incentive for you to do it because if you basically then short the stock and then you cannot get your shares from the company when you convert, then you're going to have to buy them back in the market and therefore there you're going to lose money. So this is a, a losing game there. Therefore, uh, so what the way to this, the way to essentially to discourage it to make sure that it is manipulation proof. And this is what we basically want to do to make it manipulation proof. The Kirk is easy to value. You can estimate the probability of financial distress is typically very low. You can determine that what determines the, the cost to the bondholder or the loss to the bondholder when the trigger goes off is the difference between the trigger price and the conversion price. If that gap is bigger, the bond is less risky. Right? That's one thing. If you make the, the, the smaller the gap, the more risky the bond is. So you, you can actually design bonds with different ratios of trigger versus conversion price and based on that you can determine the riskiness of the bonds. So, all right, so who should be buying these or looking well, at everybody this? Should be buying this. Right. Everybody should be buying this and everybody should issue them. I mean, it's, uh, it's because, <laughs> because ultimately it's, it's, it's an instrument that should appeal to risk-averse investors, which are many of, there are a lot of people like that, right? Uh, it should appeal to the issuers, those people actually that want to minimize the cost of financial distress. And this is what liquidity crisis to me is like an example of financial distress in the banking sector. I'm not going to give I'm not going to give short-term loans to a bank uh, if I think that the bank is going to go under. I'm going to pull out all my money. That's a cost of financial distress. You're not bankrupt yet, but because people think you go bankrupt, you actually go bankrupt. And this is what happens in those liquidity crises when, when people are taking out all their money in the banks, refusing to lend. Is then actually they go bankrupt. So that's, that's the cost of financial distress. You have to control that. The way to control that is to make sure that whenever the company gets into financial distress, it refinances itself so that it actually avoids this problem. And the, and, and the Kirk, to some extent, makes it possible to do that uh, automatically because it forces, the, in some extent, the capital structure to change when you're in distress. And that, that should be a benefit to everybody because that basically means that Companies should be able to borrow at lower rates through a Kirk than to other conventional debt instruments, because uh, because the, the the cost of financial is at the same time firm value should be higher as well. So it should be it should be an innovation that people should take a closer look at. Who's taking a closer look at Coworks? Have you gotten traction? Well, you know we have basically given presentations to a, a variety of people, so including my co-author, who present for the Federal Reserve in New York. We We've been also for the um, a conference by uh, the Bank of England. We've been to uh, presenting it to the to the Luxembourg Central Bank, and uh, my colleague has spoken to the Basel Three Committee. Has given presentations, so so there is interest in the topic. It's in but the I public sector or are banks as well interested in all this? I mean, yeah, the, the the regulators seem to be going around now, understanding that you need market-based triggers. They seem to, at least what I read now, they understand that this is the way to solve the issue. But the bankers keep fighting it because they said, well, this leads to instability and to debt spirals and whatever. The Kirk is a solution. So if, if the bankers would, if that's their argument, if that's a really true argument for being against market triggers, they should love the Kirk, they should embrace it. Now the fact is that I don't see wild enthusiasm is because they think they want to get away with essentially the capital ratio triggers, which essentially will lead to new bailouts in the future, 
which is essentially not in the interest of the taxpayers. What, what do you have to do next to make this a reality? Who would issue it? How would you sell it? I mean, what's, what's your battle plan, your marketing plan? I'm not a banker, right? So I'm not in, I'm not, I don't <laughs> have a battle plan because I'm not, really, I'm not really the general here in charge. You can go talk to <laughs> the can, marketing what department. I, what, <laughs> I can, what I can do, I can give seminars, I can give what I'm doing. I'm going to give a talk to the European Commission. Uh, so I can try to explain. Who would be selling these? I mean, the companies, the banks, the everybody? Well, the banks would issue them, obviously, and, and essentially the buyers would be institutional investors. Now, clearly there is a, according to some people, I think Barclays have made an estimate that there's a, by 2018 there's a potential market of a trillion dollars. But that requires, of course, buyers and issuers, right? Someone has to be willing to buy these things. Bondholders would love it, but, you know, we have to convince banks it's also in their interest to to issue these things. All right, so you've become a, a creator. People maybe don't think no. of uh, finance pr professors as being inventors, but here's one. What, um, what do you teach your students that would enable them to follow this kind of thinking or this kind of, uh, this kind of adventure? I think I'm trying to give the message here indeed that, that if you think creatively about things, maybe there's a solution. Now maybe, you know, there's many financial innovations that are tried and never succeed, and maybe that uh, if it's not embraced by anybody in Curse, well, it would lead a dead end in some obscure finance journal. But, <laughs> but that's at least people cannot blame me for not trying, right? So I'm trying to do my best to make a social contribution to the world and help the poor taxpayers around the world. So uh, that's all I can do. I mean, it's up to up to people. I'm. You know, I'm serving the, the plate and it's up to people to eat the cake. If they don't want to eat it, then there's not much, not much I can do about it. Theo Vermeulen, thank you very much for being with us on NCN Knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.